All right, everyone. Welcome to lecture 16. So today we're gonna to talk about hugging face and final project tutorial mainly. And as well, always, let's start with the quiz. So I'm gonna actually um, create the poll. All right, so we have three minutes. All right, so three minutes up. Okay, so first of all, 
first announcement. So the assignment three will be due next Monday. So please work on that. And the last assignment will be up next Monday. And it will be actually um, as easy as three or probably easier than three. It's on actually creating a text classification and token classification model with um, Bert Hugging Face, which I will talk about today. And it's pretty straightforward. So hopefully it's not too hard for you. And no class on Monday. I talk about this in the last lecture. So I have a, um, I have a meeting, uh, I have external meetings that I cannot skip. So I'll have to um, cancel Monday's class. I think we should be fine. I think I have covered everything we need to, to do all the assignments and also um, talk about language models. Although I think, yeah, um, probably we're not going to talk about everything about language model, but I also think that it's probably not a, not the scope of this class. Um, we don't want to be too delved into the language models. I'm actually uh, designing a language model course to be held probably in the um, next fall semester, not this spring. So if you're interested, then I think um, it will be a good next class to take if you're, if you're interested in actually learning more about the large language models. But in this class, which is more of an introductory NLP class for grad students, then um, I think um, the scope is about that. Okay, so let's first begin with the lecture 15 recap. So we actually, I talk a lot about, I think, um, the history and also, well, what um, drove the development of BERT in um, 2018. And uh, of course I say 2019 because this was officially published in NACL um, 2019, but the BERT itself was released in 2018, October. So um, around that. And we, we talk about a few important characteristics about BERT, especially compared to um, ULM fit and also GPT GPT one and um, Elmo. So, well, we know that the um, <clears throat> ULM fit was different from Elmo in that it was trying to fine tune the entire model instead of uh, building task specific layers. And also, GPT one was from different from ULM fit in that um, it was now actually considering the entire all the inputs as one sequence and also. The GPT-1 used transformer instead of LSTM. BERT was doing um, now taking a, a few steps further, and one of them was actually instead of um, creating a language model, which is a decoder, right? Because language model is a has to be a decoder. They actually made this into training in the encoder environment where you hide some tokens, you call it masking. So you hide these tokens. You basically um, replace some tokens with some special um, special symbols. And then because, because of course you don't have uh, access to the um, these tokens, then the model is actually trained to guess those tokens. And that's what people call mask LM. Okay, so that's how they are um, trained. They tra try to predict these masked um, tokens. And then when they have done this on a very large corpus and then fine tune on the target task, they actually show that this works so well that they, they could achieve the state of the art on squad within like 30 minutes of training. So after you go to lunch and come back, um, state of the art and your accuracy is actually better than the human accuracy. So it was pretty amazing back then, it's still useful. And we talk about a few differences between the architecture of BERT compared to the original transformer. And of course, note that the transformer actually, um, BERT uses transformer, but uh, it uses a, well, modified version of transformer. And what kind of things have been modified in uh, transformer? So first of all, BERT uses um, position embedding, whereas the, we, I hope you remember that transformer uses sinusoidal embedding, which is um, 
transformer is like a, you have a, this kind of a different phase sign graphs, and then um, you can theoretically extrapolate to longer sequences, although they actually don't work in, in, in practice. But BERT just uses the fixed embedding for each position, which means usually just a matrix of, uh, um, for instance, if length is 512, and the hidden size is uh, um, 1024, then basically um, you have a length of 512 and also depth of 1024 matrix that you're learning, that you're adding to the word embeddings depending on their positions. The model size difference, we're gonna talk about that. Um, we talk about that. It's also mass language model, and um, it's the training was a, a bit different. So, um, of course, um, position embedding again. Um, it's um, matrix versus uh, senior startle embeddings. Um, model size. Um, Transformer uses use six layers, but then Bert used twenty four layers. And also, this used actually um, if Bert you're using Bert large then you're actually using D equal to um, 1024. And this 24 layer is also corresponding to large. And that actually results in around 340 million parameters. It's very big, right? So if you actually store this with the flow 32, then you have to actually multiply that by four bytes because each flow 32 is uh, four bytes, which will be then one point um, something like a four to five gigabytes. Of course, the actual number can be a bit less if you actually compress that. <clears throat> and then if you're um, using flow 16, then this will be of course uh, half of that, which is 7.75 um, gigabytes without compression. A mass language model um, is different from language model in that and I think mass language model is probably sometimes people consider that to be a misnomer because it's not really language model. It's more of a, um, you're guessing the hidden word, more of a close test. Well, I mean, so some people actually like to call it a mass language model. So th that's also because BERT uses encoder and um, this cannot generate sentence, but then what they can do is if you're, you hide one word, then it's possible to use that um, word, hidden words embedding to guess what that word would have been. And that's very similar to language model. And it's hard enough that um, it's learning something very useful, linguistic and syntactic features. And training was um, a bit different from transformer as well. So. Um, there were a few fixed things. Um, they fixed length to be 512 because um, they have to learn the position embedding, which is which cannot be different for the, between training or inference, or it cannot change during training. So it has to be always fixed number. And they fixed it to be 512. Then you might ask, what should you do if the length is bigger than 512? So number one, you can truncate. So I think you have learned how to do that in the uh, assignment one. And truncation is actually very useful in many cases because it actually simplifies the problem setup. So in the early days, people were trying to actually uh, uh, um, try to handle arbitrary length. And then in practice, people found that anyways, if you see a sentence, even if you use LSTMs, if you see a sentence that's much longer than your training, training time inputs, then it will not work well. So it, it's actually more convenient and also it's, it, it's, um, also it, it's, it doesn't hurt performance to actually fix length in many cases. So what's a good thing? They just fix length and actually computation wise, GPU RAM um, size wise, you don't have to worry about the length. Um, in the old, old days, people were doing bucketing. Bucketing is actually um, really important for decoding because in decoder, your time complexity increases linearly with the length of the target sentence. So it makes sense to actually have this kind of a, a bucketing. That bucketing is, by the way, clustering the um, examples that have similar lengths so that you can actually um, don't have to waste some um, tokens with the padding because you have to you know, match the length. But if you're doing just encoding that anyway, you're using GPUs, which is uh, parallelizable. So um, it's uh, theoretically it's log n, log d, and um, practically I always told you log d is just constant number. 
So don't, you don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> so yeah. Yeah, my throats are not that good today. And they also have a batch size of 512. And I think I didn't talk about this in the last lecture, but it's a very interesting thing too. Well, um, I remember that in 2017 or 2016, um, Yan Lakun, who is like the godfather of deep learning, said, uh, is it one N, two N, I don't know, but um, said on his Facebook post, you will never need best size bigger than 16. So the intuition there was that um, stochastic gradient descent is the best thing. You shouldn't actually increase batch size too much. But turns out that actually one of the, the main, um, well, the main reason that Bert could do so well was the such large batch size. So there is a good lesson. I think even the smart, smartest person in the world, I think um, one of probably smart, smartest people, especially in the deep learning era, can be wrong. So yeah, um, it's okay to be wrong, definitely. And it needed 64 TPU chips, which is equivalent to um, something like 16 V100 GPUs. Um, and actually I was wrong here. It's not station. Station is actually only four GPUs, I think. <clears throat> it's just DGX. Um, so it's like um, these days, I think V100 is cheaper. I think it's about something like, um, I don't know, USD $150, $150,000. And it was trained for four days. So I should I told you that there is a good slide that you can take a look and then try to understand BERT. And we talk about what happened after BERT. So there are a few important changes. Well, one of them, for, for instance, was XLNet. Um, it was trying to actually. Um, one of the important thing was they used transformer Excel, which is um, use relative position encoding because BERT was using the absolute position encoding. So um, it's actually hard to, it's harder to ext extrapolate, right? Because um, it's always absolute. Um, you cannot generalize to larger, sec longer sequence easily. But then if you use relative position encoding, it's, it might be possible to actually generalize it better for longer sequence. And also it makes more sense because what really matters is relative position not the absolute position when you are trying to understand the sentence from the human's perspective or probably on from the, um, the um, what do you call, the model's perspective. And there were a few other really um, details, but um, I'll just give you my personal thought. This paper is really complicated Number one, that's number one, it's very complicated. And number two, I don't think it's that much effective compared to other simpler methods. So um, if you want to uh, read these like theoretical things, it would be good to read. But then if you're, if you like more of a simpler things that work, just work and you don't have to worry about too much about the um, complicated implementations, um, I think you can safely skip this paper. I'm not yeah, devaluing it, but just letting you know, it's very complicated paper. There's like a lot of <laughs> permutations, like mathematical stuff. And transform Excel is also quite complicated. Roberta was um, actually very impactful work in that it uses the same architecture as BERT, but only changed the some training environment. So the good thing is that the Roberta weights are interchangeable with BERT. You can just actually copy and paste into the BERT, uh, original BERT, BERT architecture. But what they did differently was that they trained BERT longer. They removed the one of the um, auxiliary tasks. They said that this is like useless, <clears throat> which is next, next sentence prediction. And it makes sense now because uh, we think that people think that um, training for really easy tasks doesn't help any, anything, especially during pre-training. And they train on longer sequences and they dynamically change the uh, masking patterns. Because um, very surprisingly, BERT actually had a fixed masking pattern, which means um, for every epoch, you will ha actually have a same mask instead of different mask. But yeah, it, it would have made, made more sense to have a dynamic mask as you 
uh, go to the next epoch because why not, right? Why not inject some randomness? But apparently they didn't do that. Uh, one reason is that um, I, uh, I think people say that um, the BERT was written in the TensorFlow and back then, especially all the data has to be written in TF record. And for efficiency, they basically just hard coded this TF record into the model. So um, it just makes the training easier, but then of course it doesn't add the dynamic nature of the masking. And they, they did some more training and then they were able to actually achieve better accuracy than BERT and also XLNet. Um, so that's why I actually um, encourage you to use your word uh, if you have to <clears throat> use something better. But also it's not worth noting that BERT sometimes does better than Roberta in some tasks. So it's not always the case that Roberta is doing the, having the best accuracy. Okay, so let's come back to the quiz. So I'm gonna end the poll. I'm gonna say first. Okay. All right, sharing it. All right, so question number one. Suppose that your model has 300 million parameters of float 16 and you have two servers connected via ethernet cable. If you want to compute the model's gradient on one server and send it to the other server, what is the minimum bandwidth of the cable to complete it in 0.1 second? So, um, for your information, so um, I told you that the BERT large has um, 340 million parameters. So you can think of this as basically a BERT large. And I just wanted to really give you the sense of uh, um, how fast the network has to be if you want to create a multi-node model that doesn't bottleneck on the network con connection. And then we're talking about flow 16. Um, and we want to send the gradient. And why do we want to send the gradient? Well, basically the motivation here is that when you're doing a multi-node training or, or multi-GPU training, you usually use data parallel, which means you actually split your batch into even number of uh, smaller batches and then send each batch to the um, each GPU. <clears throat> suppose that your batch size is like um, 16 and you have four GPUs, then you want to send four examples to each GPU so that you have uh, 16 in total. And then when you have sent the four examples to each, each GPU, you compute the gradient in that each GPU and then you want to um, aggregate these gradients from all four GPUs and take the average. That will be equivalent to actually taking uh, the average of gradient on the all 16 examples. That's what people call data parallel. <clears throat> and there's also what's called model parallel. And um, model parallel is actually, you're not um, splitting the, in the data axis, but you're actually splitting in the model axis. And why would you want to do that? In general, if you can do data parallel, then you should do data parallel because that's faster. But then sometimes you have to do, do model parallel because the model is too large that the single model doesn't fit into one GPU. So what if, for instance, the number of parameters is like um, 100 billion? Then that means even if you use flow 16, 100 billion is 200 gigabytes. So you cannot fit this entire model into one GPU. GPU, like the largest GPU that we have right now has only 80 gigabytes, right? 800. So that's when you use model parallel. That's, being, that, 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 that's used in models like GPT-3. But here, um, of course, um, <clears throat> we don't have to worry about that. Um, but let's say we want to do data parallel, then 
I think the one of the trick thing was how do you actually compute the um, size of the gradient? And if you remember what the gradient gradient is in neural network, it's just simply for um, for all i, right? So which means you will have one number per weight or per parameter. So the gradient size is equivalent to the model size, model parameter size. That's like a one important thing. And then it's um, a flow 16, so which means it's two bytes, right? Or 16 bits. And you have 300 million parameters. So how many bits is this? Um, this will be, 0 0.3 times 16 gigabits, which is 4.8 gigabits, right? Um, you can just say with small b actually. So this will be 4.8 gigabits because 16 times uh, 0.3 um, billion. So, and then we want to transfer this within 0.1 seconds, which means we want the speed to be 48 gigabits per second. So the answer is um, here, um, 48 gigabits per second. So now you see why this has to, this is really a big number. You can handle the transfer speed with Ethernet 10 gigabits. Ethernet 10 gigabits is, um, well, 10 gigabits, right? And then, what happens if you use 10 gigabits? How, many, how, much, how much time would it take to actually transfer from one computer to the other? It will take, um, well, you need to transfer 4.8 gigabits with 10 gigabits, it will take 0.5 seconds. And that's a lot if you want to train really fast because you want to make this like state update very fast, but then if you're taking all the time in the network, which will take more time within the, uh, not, uh, not on just the ethernet, but then of course there will be some bottleneck on the, some, I mean, time consumption on the PCI internal connections too. So you're spending a lot of time in the network speed. So um, that's what you want to minimize to make the model trainable in a reasonable manner, really fast. And that's why actually if you're using cloud computing, um, some computers actually, Really, if you're using a really good computers like um, a V100 times eight, I mean, eight V100 GPUs that it says it has an NVLink connected with uh, between the nodes as well. Why that's important is because if you use just typical GPU machine, then it will be connected by ethernet or even slower ones. And it's really impossible to actually create a multi-node training environment. So you have to have a dedicated um, connection between these computers and usually they are they have to be close close to each other too why because if they're if they're far away now you're actually playing the um, physics where the the speed of electrons is limited by of course the medium and it can never be faster than the speed of light right and now um, sometimes actually if the actually they're really far away suppose that you're actually talking about server in maybe in the US and in Korea, how much time does it take for the light to travel from Korea to the US? Um, it takes about like um, 0.1 second, which is not that fast, right? And that's actually speed of light. But if you're talking about the speed of electrons for um, transferring the data, it will be even slower. So you're talking about like 0.5 seconds, for instance, that's like a hard upper limit physically. So that's why the computers have to be close by as well to, to make it faster. They have to be actually in the same data station. Um, I mean, they in same data center and also um, it, it's better to actually have them close by than having a really long um, cable, what, whatever that is. The longer the cable, it becomes slower. So it was, um, I think, extra things, but hopefully um, it was helpful. Uh, number two, true or false. The benefit of mass language model is that the input distribution during pre-training is similar to that during fine, fine, fine tuning. And the answer is false because in fact, that's exactly the, not the benefit, but disadvantage. Because you have, if you want to train a model um, with the mask, 
pre-trained, then that, that means that you're actually observing these mask tokens, mask symbols that you will never observe during your uh, fine tuning, right? That's why the input distribution will be very different from pre-training and the fine tuning. And that's actually one of the uh, worst, um, I mean, what people think is the bad thing about BERT. We, we, although I'm not really sure, actually, it, it really matters a lot, but I think there are a few works pointing out that they, they actually matter. And lastly, so oh, the answer is false. And lastly, true or false, BERT uses the encoder transformer for mass language modeling. Well, it's true, right? I think most people got it right. So that's great. So I think number one was a bit difficult, but number two and three, I think more people got it right. So um, that's great. All right, so um, actually today's lecture will be twofold. One is that I'll be going through the hugging face tutorial briefly so that um, to give you an idea how it works how the library works is pretty, um, I think, relatively straightforward. And number two is after break, uh, Miyoung uh, will be presenting, giving a um, tutorial on the final project for those of you who are working on uh, final project. So it will be good to actually um, be there if you're especially working on the final project. So I'm going to talk for the next, um, like, um, I will say about 10 minutes. I think we'll take a break a bit late today. Um, I'll, we'll take a break from probably 45 to 50 and then come back at 50 for um, 25 minutes of um, tutorial on the final project. Um, so the this will be short tutorial on hugging faces transformers. And um, just to, to give you a little history behind it. So hugging face actually, maybe I think if, if you're interested in NLP, probably you have heard of this for sure. And you might be wondering what 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 is this company and why are people are using hugging face? There's actually history behind it. So um so hugging face was actually um originally a company making chatbots. And when BERT came out, so uh, it was in TensorFlow in October 2018. Um, Hugging Face was one of the first teams to actually port it to PyTorch. And fortunately, well, I mean, one thing was the porting probably was not too easy, right? Because um, um, you have to actually make sure that the model um, works in the same manner. But then, and actually the Hugging Face couldn't really port the pre-training mechanism, um, I think until like a year or two, year, two years later. But then what they could do very fast was porting it so that it's actually fine tunable. And that was actually a very, very um, good thing that they did because basically because of that, everyone in the PyTorch community who wanted to use BERT went to Hugging Face instead of the Google, Google's repository, which is actually using TensorFlow. And even then TensorFlow that's actually uh, mostly working on, well, it originally was on TPUs and they had to a lot of make a lot of changes to make it work on um, non TPUs. And, and back then they used the, this repository name transformers to actually release that and that actually made the repository so popular that um, it became even more popular than the, their chatbots, which was their original business. So um, recently they just decided to actually pivot their business. Um, from chapel making to basically ML ops, uh, mostly uh, um, focusing on some large language models, transformer based language models. And of course, these days we're using transformers for like almost everything. So it was also actually their good decision that transformer is now very versatile. So everyone just goes to this library if they want to use transformer based architecture. That's even more popular than the Google's original transformer or um, Google's original BERT repositories. And they're actually now a really big company. I mean, they're not just making, they're not just maintaining one repository. Actually, they're um, very profitable, actually, too. They have APIs that they sell to um, companies. And then they, I think, said like earlier this year that they already actually, um, they crossed the BEP, which is um, break even point. So they're earning more than that what they're um, spending. That's actually very uh, fascinating given that they're hard tech company and many hard tech companies actually cannot earn until like, you know, 
their business matures, you know, um, a lot of uh, these self-driving car companies are losing, you know, millions of dollars every year, hoping that they will actually make it profitable at some point, right? But then, of course, this is a software company, so we cannot com have a direct comparison, but still, um, they're actually doing pretty well in terms of business. And they are now, I think, uh, value may be even bigger than that. Maybe they're approaching Unicorn, which is $1 billion before IPO. Okay, so um, I'll just give you a quick tutorial, like spend the next 10 minutes on this and have a five minute break and then come back for the uh, final project tutorial. I'm gonna share the screen. So, I'm gonna share the screen. Oh, there are a few questions. Sorry, I, I didn't answer these things. Okay, so um, answering your question. So Yasuo's question. So. Gigabits and gigabytes are different. Gigabits is actually bits, right? Bytes is eight bits. So one gigabytes is eight gigabits. Um, and the, yeah, that's what also Mary said, right? And optimizing communication like approximate partial sync may be important. Yeah, that's true. All right, so um, I put the link on the slide. So if you go there, it will be good to actually take a look at this tutorial if you're unfamiliar with the uh, BERT. So, I mean, not Hugging Face uh, Transforms Library, but I can tell you pretty quickly. So um, we, you're familiar with this, right? You basically can import data set with that. Um, INDB is just a similar data set to this 10-4 sentiment tree bank, except that I believe they have 10 classes because it's score, score from one to 10. They're trying to classify each review into the scores, each movie review. IMDB is a movie database, a movie review database also. And then here's um, something that probably you don't know yet if you haven't used it. So they actually provide tokenizer. You had to build the tokenizer yourself until now. Uh, space split or use regular expression, but now you can use tokenizer that was actually um, that that actually works works with the the model that you're gonna use, and it's important to actually specify the model name here. It's BERT base cased, so BERT is the name of the model. Base is the size. Base has a uh, 110 million parameters, so it's one third of the BERT large. You probably don't need to use BERT large um, in many cases because people also uh, saw that actually BERT large performance is not, um, not always better than BERT base, although usually they are. And then case means that we are actually differentiating between the upper case, upper, upper case and lower case um, in English. So um, it's usually case is better if you want to, um, for instance, differentiate some named entities that have a uppercase letter for the first letters, right? And then the reason why you have to use, um, you have to specify the model name is because model was trained with that tokenizer, right? Um, here, the tokenizer is the bi-pair encoding tokenizer, but um, it's a bit different. It's Google's version, which is word piece. It's very similar, but then um, there are a few differences. We, we talked about bi-pair encoding earlier in the lecture. Um, it's good. Maybe it would be good to review it if you don't remember well. But um, at least in terms of this um, tutorial, you don't have to really know what that is at the moment, except that by pair encoding or word piece actually has a sub word. And um, Bert uses the sharp, sharp, uh, two sharps um, to indicate that the um, whatever that uh, the word actually is not standalone, but there was a sub word before that. And they has to be. They have to be attached 
when they're um, when you're actually trying to recover the original sentence. And then you use this tokenizer to basically um, tokenize, and it's very easy to use. Just uh, call this tokenizer, and then you have sentences. And there's a padding, uh, which basically pads if the length is smaller than um, the max length, right? We, we know what that is. And it says max length here because BERT has max length, which is 512. So in this case, what they're saying is that the model, uh, the, this tokenizer will automatically pad to 512. And truncation true, we know what that is too, right? Because we did this in assignment one, that if it's too long, then just truncate. And that's the easiest way to handle these um, variable length inputs. Of course, uh, we might not want to do that in some cases, but in uh, most cases that could can be the first thing to try. And then, um, well, it's basically just create a function here so that you can use this function into this, um, well, data set that you created above, right? So you create, you have this data set and then you uh, map this to, uh, with this tokenized function so that um, it's just applying tokenizer, but then you're applying this lazily instead of, uh, um, lazily means that you don't apply this at this point, but you apply it only when it's needed. It's a functional programming uh, pr uh, practice, but you can think of this as basically you apply the um, tokenizer at this point. Um, well, in terms of, uh, what it's doing it, what's, what, what it's doing. But in practice, in the, in the, in the um, backend, it hasn't tokenized yet. It, will la it lazily tokenizes so that it only tokenizes when it needs to at the end. And it's, that's true means that you basically, um, well, it's pretty simple, right? You make a batch of it um, and then you basically create the data set um, by shuffling and selecting. It's pretty straightforward by looking at what that is. And um, you now load the model as well. It's a very simple way. Uh, you load a model for sequence classification, which means that you're going to use the, uh, the embedding of the CLS token at the front of BERT. And you specify how many labels you want to actually uh, classify into. So this model's output will be um, two numbers. Each number is logic for that class and you have to apply softmax on top of it to uh, make this into probabilistic distribution. And then, um, well, you just define some training arguments. It's, um, they just have uh, some default arguments here. And then um, you create a trainer, which is a, a help, help, helper function that make, uh, helps you to train the model. So you specify the model, um, the default training arcs, specify training data set and evaluation data set. And then you just call this to train. And that's it. The model trains itself. And then you have to now also evaluate. But in order to evaluate, you need to define the metric. You can actually. Uh, also use a predefined metric, which is accuracy. And then you, cre you create a function that the, um, the, the trainer, trainer class can take in. I mean, the, you, can, you want to create a function in a form that the trainer, trainer uh, class can take in, which is uh, this function takes in the uh, prediction tensors. And then you basically, um, of course, split that into logits and labels because the prediction will be consist of uh, the um, logits, the models outputs and labels, which are the, the ground truth. And then, then after that, you perform the argmax to get the prediction labels and then you just do um, computation of metric, which is the accuracy. And you just put this into the trainer again. And then this time you're not training, but you're just evaluating. So trainer.evaluate. And this basically will give you the um, accuracy of, for instance, 87.5%, which is very high. And one thing I know actually missed is that um, the looks like the number of labels for um, IMDB is not 10, but it's two. Um, I'm not sure why that's the case. I have to double check, but it's possible that uh, it, it was 10, but then they 
made this into two because it's easier and also usually it doesn't really make sense to um, classify movie reviews into really fine-grained ones. Um, well, I mean, it's not that it doesn't make sense, but people are more interested in the, the clear distinctions. Usually positive and negative reviews are very clearly, clearly distinctive, but then score of seven and eight, it's really hard to distinguish between them, even for humans, right? So that could be why it's quite similar to, in that sense, Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank. Okay, so hopefully that was enough. It was pretty straightforward, hopefully. And um, well, there was there are some other things here, but I think it should be okay for you because they're about using fine tuning with Keras. So you should be fine with using only PyTorch. You can watch these videos too, if you want to. But um, I'll end my tutorial here and your assignment for it will be actually something like that. And actually it will be also as simple as that. So it's not probably too difficult. Um, okay, so we're gonna have, um, well, we'll come back at um, 4.52 to have a um, project tutorial by Mia. Um, are you here, Mia? Yes. Okay, that's good. Okay, so yeah, let's have a five minute break and then come back and then yeah, please uh, prepare, uh, please uh, begin your tutorial after that. Thanks a lot.
All right, so welcome back. So let's begin the final project tutorial by Mia. So um, yeah, could you please, I'll make you co-host so that you can share your screen. I just did, so please share um, your screen if you need to. And yeah, please um, feel free to start. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, I can see it. Then I can start the tutorial um, from now on. Um, I think this, this tutorial code is Link for the tutorial code is also provided in our final, final project instruction. So you can check it out again using that those link. And this tutorial is about the DPR baseline using the subset of Wikipedia that solved the open domain question answering. And this code is from the efficient QA challenge baseline. So you can see the original code with this, with this link. And also, uh, we don't have time and hardware resource to train the whole encoder for retriever and wither. So we just we just load the pre-trained checkpoints of wither and wither, wither retriever and wither to solve the ODQA. And if you want to train the whole encoder and retriever for your project, you can follow the instruction given by this DPR lab book. Well, I think it would be also good to briefly explain what the efficient QA is and uh, what natural questions are. Uh, okay, yeah. Maybe we can use this link to explain what the efficient QA and natural question is. Uh, first of all, uh, I mentioned the natural questions and natural question opens because in this tutorial, we will solve the QA open domain question answering with, the, with natural questions open data set. And natural questions open is the open domain QA version of the natural question data set. And natural questions is the data set they collected from Google. And here's the little bird. And it is similar, it is looks similar to the squad, but different for the squad is that it collects the queries that is real from, from the real users. You can find, you can also find more details in this paper, paper and you can download the, download the questions with in this page or using the hugging face data set. And natural question open is the open domain question answer version of natural questions. And the difference between natural questions and natural questions open is natural question open does not provide the context information for the question and answer. It just contains the QA pair. You, you have to retrieve the passage from the Wikipedia documents to solve the NQ open. An efficient QA is the open domain QA challenge that the goal of this challenge is they limit the resource and solve the open domain query with those limited resources. And there are multiple track and you can find uh, the track has the size with unrestricted size uh, from our uh, the 25% smallest from 100 megabytes and six gigabytes. And you can find the neighbor in here. Okay. And I, and this tutorial code is from the Vision QA challenge, challenge baseline code, which used the dense passage retriever as the retrieval model. And you can see the exact example of NQ open in this below cell. So I just go through the next part. So uh, this part is about the requirements and most of this baseline tutorial code is about download and set up the models and set up the data set. So you just first run the DPR repo 
And for the reproducibility, I just picked the version. And I realized that the newest version is came after writing this tutorial code. So if you want more, more advanced DPR model weights, then you can use the latest version of DPR. And this is for other packages. Uh, I, um, I think the download is done. So we can go through the data set part. Uh, we, start, we first load the data set. Uh, in this loading data set part, part, you have to load the data sets for open domain question answering and for retriever part, part. For retriever part, we have some documents, dump of documents called from Wikipedia to retrieve the relevant documents related relevant documents related to the question in NQ Open. For the NQ Open, and even for natural questions and other various types of NLP tests, you just simply use this data set package to load them. This is from Hugging Face, and it collected a various types of data set, and you can just simply load the data set with, if you know the name of the data set. So in, we first load the NQ Open with this code, this code then it download the data set and store in cache. Then the loading is done. And you can check the details of data set in this cell. Uh, the number of training samples is about uh, 87,000 samples and number of ballet samples are 1,800 samples. And the form structure of the data sets are presented like this way. Uh, you can find it only contains the answer and question or like the extractive QE data set that also contain the context. You have to retrieve the relevant context to by retriever to answer the question. Well, I think there is a chat. Mm. Uh, yes, it's not for me. I think it's for professor. Yeah, then I go through the tutorial session. And, and because we just load the checkpoints and with, without any training, so we just use the validation data set with 1800 samples, uh, just load the question and answers for the validation split. And this part is a little, uh, this little tricky, tricky that for the retriever, we need additional Wikipedia documents to retrieve the context that consists of multiple documents. And uh, in this tutorial, as the time and, and the time and hardware, hardware is limited, I just download the subset of Wikipedia, which consists of the relevant documents in natural questions. And you can find the performance of full and subset of the model of Wikipedia in this page. And as you can see, of in for DPR, the full Wikipedia leaders much better performance. So if you have in your final project, I'll recommend you to use Wikipedia full rather than the Wikipedia subset if you want to increase improve your performance. So this is download the Wikipedia subset. And this part is code for downloading the full Wikipedia. And I just comment it because I don't want to run this part. It takes too much time and storage. After download is done, you just load the with passages using this code. Yeah, I think even though the subset, 
even the Wikipedia is a subset subset of Wikipedia. Uh, it is about gigabytes, so it takes some time to download all. I just I just explain the next part. The download is done, and after the we download the Wikipedia documents and loading the natural question open data set, we just download the EPR checkpoints for retriever, reader, and FICE index. FICE is the package that boosts up the nearest neighbor search using the nearest neighbor search. And in open domain question answering, it is very com common to use this, this index for finding the relevant documents. So this part, I think this part also takes some time. Yeah. The first, first line is for download the retriever checkpoint. And second is for download the DPR device index. And the last line is for download the reader. And there is the question that if you train only an input data set, it is possible to react the same performance as in the paper? Uh, you mean the performance given by the checkpoints? Ah, uh, I think this checkpoint is the outdated one. If you want to reach the performance in the paper or the, the latest version, you will you have to use these checkpoints, and the performance of these checkpoints are provided in this way. And if you use the checkpoints, the latest checkpoints with this DPR, with this line, this line of code, then you can reach the performance in the paper. Yeah. I think in this tutorial, we can reach, we can't reach the performance in the paper because we just use the Wikipedia subset. So yeah, yeah we cannot reach the, as the paper that presented in the paper. I th think the exam match score in this tutorial is about 30 percent. And the, the downloading part takes my lots of time. And this code is for setting up the arguments for open domain question answering that includes the number of documents to retrieve and evaluate, evaluate document number of documents and so on. And we will use the bird based on case for free train model. This, this cell does not require most time. So we just explain the, this cell and waiting for download is complete. And it's just downloading the index. Uh, and also the dense passive, passive retriever, the DPR index is for the subset of Wikipedia. And if you use the full Wikipedia, you have to run this code, not this one. This one is this uh, this one does not include the passage not included in the subset Wikipedia. And also this part takes a lot of time, more than 50 gigabyte. And after the download is done, uh, you can set up the arguments for inference or even the training. And using the argument, you set up the model, the encoder, and we don't have to train the encoder and reader. So we set up the encoder as evaluation mode, uh, evaluation mode, and you just use those encoder to encode the question and find the relevant documents from the Wikipedia dump. And after the downloading and the downloading and setup for the model and retriever reader is done, you can start you can start solving the QA test, open domain QA test that consists of two steps. First, retrieve the relevant documents and answer the question based on the relevant documents. And I don't execute this cell, this three part, because uh, when we run both these three 
and four in a single call up session, then it will expire because it does it requires more memory, more memory than the free free club provided. So yeah. don't be afraid if you run this part and it's a good this part, then it explodes. <laughs> Uh, so this, I just explained this part, and you can see the log when I execute this one. So you can execute by use yourself in your own machine or any more expensive collab version pro collab pro. And the retrieve retriever retrieve the documents from the Wikipedia subset dump. So. The first step we have to do is first encode the question into the vector and then compare the vector with the, the vectors of the documents and then finally find the relevant documents. So this part load the retriever and using those loaded retriever, we first generate the vectors from using the encoder and then retrieve the documents using this line of code. And we set up the end documents as 100. So it will, it will retrieve 100 documents per each query. And you can see uh, we, as we use the index, by index, the search time is not that long, but the memory requirement is quite large for this retriever part. And after the retriever is Retriever stop is done. You save the retrieve wizard in this file, and you can you also validate the retrieve wizard by comparing the hit documents. And you can see the hit documents, number of hit documents, and the fraction of okay, accuracy of hit documents in this wizard. And as you can see, as k becomes larger, the performance, the accuracy, and number of hit documents are increased. You save the result in this retrieval file. And finally, uh, you check off the length of the retrieve result, 100 documents per each query. So total 1,800 documents, 1,800 questions for 1,800 questions and 100 documents for each question. And I think as this if you're in this for quite, quite a long time. So I just go this part. Uh, and to reduce the time and I want to run the reader part in this collab file, I ran the above part in my own computer and I save in my Google Drive. And you can download the Google, that reader using this link. And when you down, download this, uh, you can find the same reader as here. And yeah, we load the retriever wizard. And using this retriever wizard, we run we run the reader to predict the final answers. And we use the trainer that predict the answers and compare the question and prediction with the answers. And at this this part is for removing the pico file and validate the results. And if you if if you check the log, log after learning this cell, you can find that the final results for our pre, our model in this tutorial is about 30% exam best score. And, and you can change this part, change the number of documents to evaluate also in this arguments in this part. This evar top docs means that you evaluate the results with top 10 documents, top 20 documents, top 40 documents to top 100 documents. And the result in here means that this is that my score is from the, the reader production result with 10 top documents. And I think, yeah, I think it's still download the index. So, we just go into, we just read this log. And there is a question that if 
we use default Wikipedia. Should we train from scratch how many days it will, it will take to train from scratch? You don't have to train from scratch. Uh, actually, the wage for reader and retriever is also applicable for full Wikipedia dump, but you have to download the index for full Wikipedia dump. Also, the index file for full Wikipedia dump is provided in this link. And also, you can check the link in here too. So, and I think the time consumes for training from the scratch is depending on your hard hardware. So I'm I cannot sure how it takes because even for me, I haven't trained it from the scratch. In this tutorial, if you want to use full Wikipedia, just comment this cell and use this cell and comment this line and download this line. But I think Collab does not support the 50, 50 gigabytes in this file in free version. So you have to use your own machine or other source to run this whole Wikipedia full code. Yeah, I think we, yes, I think download cannot complete in one minute. So yeah, we just check our leisure using this log. And I and this is the end of the tutorial. And if you have any questions about the tutorial or the peer or the baseline code. But you have yes, someone has a question. <laughs> Which part can we change to improve the performance without retraining? Mm. I think training. I think the performance, the goal of our final project is not only for the performance. You can improve the efficiency or the speed, searching speed, search speed, or any other factors to improve the recent checkpoints or the recent uh, the previous research that is done in open domain QA field. So uh, if you are, uh, you have you don't have to be too stressed to retrain this old retriever or reader. Uh, you have to you don't have to improve the performance in entry question. You just have some improvement in the perspective of efficiency or any other any other contribution is also okay for the last project. Yeah, and I think uh, what you're asking exactly point of the project. So hopefully you can find improvement where you can improve it. Okay, so regarding the computational resources, I, maybe I can give you a better answer. So um, as far as I know, the well, the Graduate School of AI now have a has a cluster, so I think um, AI AI uh, could AI um, KAIST AI students will have the access to that. I'm not sure about the um, non KAIST AI students. So I believe, do you not have uh, access to computational resources in your lab? Or I mean, if you're a KAIST AI student, then you should you can use the cluster.
Okay, so I think there are a few students who are not. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, so actually, uh, okay. Well, I see <laughs> that, I mean, I don't think that's a weird thing, but I, I guess like I see your point, yeah. I mean, um, well, I think the best way is that uh, you, if you can use the lab, uh, the, uh, the um, KAIST AI cluster, that would be the best. So um, if you can, okay, let's do this way. So for, Yeah, so uh, Bian, could you actually ask the department if um, it's possible to make accounts for um, non KAIST AI students temporarily? And then if, if it's possible, then I think um, we can do that. Otherwise, if you really think you're lacking the computing resources, but you really want to do final project instead of the assignment, then I think let's see what we can do about it. But um, yeah, we don't have uh, the cloud credits at the moment, so it's probably very um, limited. So I think probably the one best place is actually using the Colab Pro or um, Colab. Um, I think there are higher membership now, so I think that's one way. For most applications, probably Colab is not too bad. I mean, Colab Pro is not too bad. Okay, yeah, so yeah, um, so that's hopefully answering your question. Yeah, so uh, Myung, please, yeah, could you please ask the department about uh, temporarily um, using the accounts? Okay, sounds great, yep. And then please uh, let, uh, let me know or let the uh, people know actually on the GitHub discussions. Yeah, I think the, the problem is that Yeah, I mean, because like there, it, it has to go through some um, approval to use the Amazon server. Um, so, okay, I'll try to figure out too on my side. So I think Myung can take care of the um, the AI AI um, Kais AI uh, GPU cluster. I can try to see what I can do with the Amazon server. Who was the professor, by the way? Is it Professor Juzegor? Is it AI604? Okay, yeah, I'll ask him then. All right, so then we're gonna end the class here. Um, so no class on Monday. I'll see you on Wednesday. We'll come back to the um, language models that are more geared towards um, generation than just classification. All right, thanks a lot, everyone.